Welcome to Class Time, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. I am Georgia Crawford Williams, your CAPE sociology teacher for today. And this morning, we are going to continue our discussions on the perspectives. In particular, we're going to be looking at the conflict perspective. So, here we go. Now, you all remember last week, and you know you should always do a recap. Once it is that you're going to go to another subject, another topic, you do a recap automatically, right? So last week, we looked at the perspectives overall, yeah? And we said to you that when we speak about a perspective, a sociological perspective gives a theoretical explanation of society's existence. So all sociological perspectives try to explain why society exists, good? Now, we explained that to, that's because sociology in and of itself is the study of society and why it exists. And so when it is that you want to be a student of sociology, you should be trying to explore why society exists and these perspectives do just that. That being said, we also explained to you that there are four major perspectives. Four major perspectives, functionalism, conflict, interactionism, and the feminist perspective. Now, do you remember the major functionalists? Because remember, we made it clear to you that you cannot actually do sociology and you don't know the names. A sociological essay without names is like a history essay without dates. And so you must remember the big functionalist. Not only because he is major, but because he is a major functionalist, sorry, but because he's a major sociologist in general, yeah? Emile Durkheim is that major sociologist. Good. So last week, we looked at Emile Durkheim and we looked at functionalism and we looked at how they compared society to the human body, etc., etc. Today, we're going to look at the conflict perspective. So let's get into it. Now, the conflict perspective, unlike the functionalist perspective, believe that societies are plagued with inequalities and conflict. If you remember when we did functionalism, people like Emile Durkheim said to us that, hey, society is in existence because we have all of these functional institutions and they're all doing what they're supposed to be doing. As a result of that, we find that there is very little conflict in society. As a matter of fact, the major criticism of the functionalists is that they're utopian. They have this perfect view of society. They think everything are going good. The conflict perspective said, no, no, that doesn't make sense at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at societies in general, they're always filled with inequalities and as a result of that, conflict. From the beginning of time, all societies have looked like that. Now, when we speak of the conflict perspective, it is important to note that the conflict perspective has many, many theories. However, the big theory is Marxism. And the theory that is most important for your syllabus is Marxism. So we're going to look at the Marxist theory, which is a conflict theory. However, Marxism is not the conflict perspective. The conflict perspective has many, many theories of which Marxism is one and is the major one. And so I always say to my students, it's like when it is that you speak to persons who are not familiar with the Caribbean and you say to them, like, I'm from Guyana. But because they're not familiar with the Caribbean, the only country that comes to mind is Jamaica, because Jamaica might be the most prominent one, the one that is most popular. And so when you say, I'm from Guyana, they're like, huh? You say, oh, in the Caribbean. They say, oh, you mean Jamaica. Do you know you're saying both? And you're like, no, no, not Jamaica. Guyana is different from Jamaica. Marxism does the same thing for the conflict perspective. Marxism is just one of the conflict theories. But it is so big a theory and has become so essential that when people think conflict, they automatically think Marxism. But when you're going to your exam, and they will go in the exam and see it, and they ask about the conflict perspective, you cannot say that the conflict perspective is Marxism. Marxism is just one of the conflict theories, the major one, and for your syllabus, the one that we will be looking at. Good? So, let's go to what Karl Marx has to say. I said to you before, you cannot, let me go again, you cannot go into sociology, be a student of sociology, and you don't know the names. You must know the names. And so Karl Marx is a person that gave us Marxism. 
Karl Marx, you know, who's European, ironically did not see himself as a sociologist. He saw himself as an economist, he saw himself as a philosopher, he saw himself as a politician. But then he wrote this book, he called it the Communist Manifesto. And when it was that persons read it, they say, but the man here, he might explain why society exists. And if it is that you're explaining why society exists, then automatically you are a sociologist. And so they started to follow the writings of Marx and they called themselves the Marxist. And the theory now became Marxism. Now, what does the theory say? Now, Marx asserts that throughout history, there have always been two groups. One small rich group, and one large poor group. He said from the beginning of time, since we passed hunting and gathering bands, there have always been two groups, one small rich group and one large poor group in every single society. Now, when you think about the small rich group and the large poor group in the capitalist society, which is a society that we live in now, in the capitalist society, our society now, we find that the rich are called the bourgeois. It's French, so it is spelled bourgeoisie, but it's pronounced bourgeois. Yeah? So the rich are called the bourgeois, and the poor are called the proletariats. And you have to say bourgeois now because you're an advanced level student. You've got university next year. So you know, say bourgeoisie. It's spelled bourgeoisie, but it's pronounced bourgeois. So in the capitalist society, the rich are the bourgeois, and the poor are called the proletariats. Good? So in this society, you have the small rich group, bourgeois, large poor group, proletariats. Now, according to Marx, when you look at the society, man has to produce. Man has to produce to live. And the bourgeois, they own the means of production. The small rich group, they own the means of production. That means that they own land, they own capital, they own scientific know-how, entrepreneurship, that sort of thing. They own what Marx called the means of production. Whereas the proletariats who are the poor, the only thing them own is them labor. You ever hear people say you come with your too long hand? Well, the poor people, them, them come with them too long hand. However, Marx says that if man is to produce and man must produce to live, you need the means of production, but you also need the labor. Which means that if it is that we are to survive, the bourgeois need the proletariats and the proletariats need the bourgeois. We have to come together to produce so that we can all live. And that Marx say no. So the small rich group, they need the large poor group. The bourgeois need the proletariats because the bourgeois have the means of production and we need that to produce. And the proletariats have the labor and you need that to produce. So everything should have really Chris and Corey because you know, you need me and me need you and together we're gonna come together now and we're gonna produce and we're gonna eat and live and be merry. But Marx said that does not happen. Instead, what takes place according to Marx is that the bourgeois exploit the proletariat. The bourgeois exploit the proletariat by stealing the wealth that is produced by the labor. Marx said what happened? Is that we decide so we're gonna make all a cheer. Yeah? The bourgeois come and then provide the scientific know-how to make the cheer. Then provide the material for make the cheer. Then provide the money so the business can start. And that's a go on, yeah? And the proletariat, he comes with his labor. Him literally go put the cheer together. When it is a, a sun a shine and him out there and the sun at a lick off him finger with armor because they must make the cheer. That means I'll come, we come together to make this cheer. Now, when it is that we make the chair and the chair is sold, wealth is created. So, so the bourgeois come and him spend $10 so the chair can make. Then, him pay the proletariat $5 for make the chair. Yeah? So, $15 totally spent on the chair. But then the chair sells for all $500. So, $15 is the cost to make the chair, but then you sell it for $500. That means you make profit. You make about $485. What a profit. Now, according to Marx, if it is that we are being fair, that profit should have really share. Yeah, because remember, you carry your scientific know-how and your material, but I me carry the labor. Yeah, and my little creativity. And me decide to so go put a little nail right here. So. Yeah, and me out in the sun. So the two we come together and we created this chair that bring forth wealth. And so in reality, the wealth should have share. But Mark said that doesn't happen. 
Instead, when the wealth is created, the bourgeois, which is the small rich group, take the majority of the wealth, keep it for themselves, and give the proletariat a small amount called wages. So $485 get, and out of that the proletariat get $5, and the bourgeois keep $400. Yeah, enough, enough, I feed them on that. And so Marx says, instead of having this wonderful relationship of equality, of mutual respect and understanding, that not happen. Instead, we have conflict because the bourgeois continue to exploit the proletariat. The bourgeois exploit the proletariat by stealing the wealth that has been created by their labor. As a consequence of that, society is filled with conflict. Now remember, you know, the first thing we tell you is that we're looking at the conflict perspective and that Marx is a conflict theorist. So he, like all the other conflict theorists, believe that society is filled with conflict. Marx said the conflict comes from the fact that the bourgeois, when them come together with the proletariat to create and build wealth, when the wealth is created, the small rich group, the bourgeois, take the whole of the money and give the proletariat a small amount called wages. But let me ask a question. Here it is, you know, say you make the chair, yeah? You know, say the boss only spend $10 upon it, yeah? And you know, go see the chair and sell for $500. So you know, say the boss I make four hundred and dollars and you only make $5. Why you go back to work the next morning, go make more chair? Why do you continue to exist in this exploitive relationship with the bourgeois? Why all of the poor people who know that they are being exploited continue day after day to go back at the exploitive work? Why is it that it continues? Now, this is a key question. And Marx answers it with a key term. Marx says, the proletariats... They remain, the proletariats remain in their exploitive relationship with the bourgeois because they are taught the false class consciousness. I take in a moment for you to write that down. That's a key term for Marx, just like bourgeois and proletariats. That's a key term. Marx says the proletariats, which are the poor, you notice how oh, many say poor, me say proletariats become I want to reinforce the use of the key term. I want to reinforce the jargon. Remember, I said it to you last class. When you go into an exam, I don't need to know whether you're bright or done. So you just have to convince me, so you're bright. And to convince me, you have to use the jargons. So instead of saying the poor, you say the proletariats. Instead of saying the rich, you say the bourgeois. And then I mark him and say, watch the one here. The one here move right, so take it. Yeah? So I'm saying to you that Marx says that the proletariats remain in their exploitive relationship with the bourgeois because of the false class consciousness. The false class consciousness are a set of lies that justify the oppression. The false class consciousness keep the proletariats oppressed because they believe that a sunny system set. Yeah? So the false class consciousness is a set of lies that the bourgeois teach the proletariats. The bourgeois actually use the institutions. The bourgeois use the institutions to teach the false class consciousness, to teach the lies that justify oppression. And so Marx says, the family teach you the false class consciousness. Him say, education teach you false class consciousness. Him say, religion, oh, Marx hate religion. Marx says that religion is the major perpetrator of the false class consciousness. So every institution teach the lies. But you say, religion? Marx say religion teach it the most, yeah? Religion is the major perpetrator of the false class consciousness. Religion teach us the lies that justify our oppression, that keep us in the relationship, the exploitive relationship with the bourgeois. So Marx say if you look from the Bible, yeah? Look at the things that the Bible teach you. The Bible said to you, say, leave vengeance to the Lord. And so when you find out that your boss is exploiting you, that he really a rob you, you're not supposed to go in there and do nothing about it because you say, God, God, I got to start it out. God, I got to take care of it. Mark says, if you look at religion, religion says things like, blessed are the poor. 
Yeah? And so you know who now have nothing, and you see the rich man have enough things, you actually think that you're better off because you're blessed and you're going to go ever, go drink milk and honey. Because the scripture said to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go ever. So when you're there poor and a suffer, you say, so the thing set us so God want it. But you see, later will be greater. Later, me go inherit the earth, me go go heaven, go drink milk and oaty. And you see, the rich man there, hell. Him say, just the concept of heaven and hell keep you in the exploitive relationship. Because you say, right now, me not forget everything good upon earth. Because you see, my reward is great in heaven. So yeah, me will take the pittance, me take the little bit of money, me will go and live on tomorrow, no. But you see later, when me go ever, you see the rich man there, he may rose in a hell. So I don't need to change things right now. Just that concept of hell. I put it to you that if you're walking on the road, and a man in a big vehicle, drive and him splash you up, you vex, 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 and you say, you say, you, you got hell. And that alone make you feel better because you really feel so you got hell and you got heaven. He said that is the way the teaching justify oppression. He said if you look at the teaching of the Bible, it tells you that the Lord has ordained it. And so if you now have nothing, I saw God want it. And when God ready, God soon changes. So if it not change yet, I just saw it with steer. Yeah? And so he gave a very good example of a hymn. The hymn is called All Things Bright and Beautiful. And he says in that hymn, there's a verse that had to be removed because people start cuss. The verse said, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. That means that God want who for rich, rich, and God want who for poor, poor. And so if exploitation are gone, I saw God say it for set. You understand? Just wait till God ready to start it out. And so he says, and this is so very key, and we're going to meet it again when we get to religion. Mark says that religion is the opium of the people. Key something where Mark say. Religion is the opium of the people. Now an opium is a drug. It's a drug them give you when you feel pain. However, the drug don't take with the pain. Opium don't take with the pain. What opium do is numb your body. And so the pain is still there, but you can't feel it. Mark says religion does that to oppression and exploitation. It numb you to the exploitation and oppression. It not take with the exploitation, but because you're so caught up on religion, you can't feel it. And so you got church. And you got church and you not eat nothing from morning. Yeah? And so you did and you're hungry. But then the sister start with praise and worship and by the time you start sing, you know, member. You know, member say you're hungry. As a matter of fact, you go in and you testify. And you say, this man in a come here and I did a suffer. Yeah? But when Sister Shirley starts singing, I tell you I don't feel it anymore. Everybody clap for your life. Yeah? Church I go on. Yeah? He said that is what religion does to people. And when it is that you start suffer, it explains it away. It allows you to take it on because guess what? God know where my do. And then when you start suffer more, you say, listen, man, God now give me more than him can bear. God now give me. And when it get even worse than that, you start, less man of the devil at test me. And when it get worse around, you say, I want to be like Job. You say, that is how religion helps to teach the false class consciousness. And in so doing, keep the poor poor. Mark says the worst thing for happen to poor people are religion. That's what Mark said. Good. Now remember, when you're doing sociology, you don't have to agree with what the theory say. Because many of us, when we start hearing what Mark said, now we start get antsy. You want to pray for the teacher. You know, yes, I want a woman, you turn off all your TV, because this can't write. Yeah? Remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to understand. I don't agree with that part of it. I'm, I mean, I'm a Christian myself. But I understand the theory that he is, you know, that he has explained to us. But remember, Religion might be the major perpetrator of the false class consciousness, but it is not the only one. Religion is not the only institution that teaches us the lies that justify our oppression. Marx says the education system justifies our oppression. He said, when you go to school, they make it look to you that your failure or success is your fault. That's how school make it seem. And so when it is that you're done school and you don't get the big qualification and you don't get the big work and so you get a little bit of money, you feel that is your fault. 
But him say, in reality, the education system is so designed that the rich will pass and the poor will fail. If you look at our system right now, those who have money for computer and Wi-Fi and internet, they have been getting lessons continuously and those who don't have no money, no get none. We are talking about months, you know, if I never have a TVG, if I come in and start, get some, you know, free class on television, some of you would have had no teaching at all. Them said that I show you, said the system is rigged, it is flawed, so that the rich will pass and the poor will fail. But them not tell you that. Them tell you, say, if you fail, it's your fault. Mark say if you look at the system overall, yeah, if you don't have no book, you can't get through. Hmm? Even those who have the aptitude, those who bright, when it's time for go to university, if you don't have the money, you can't get through. And so the system is so designed that the rich will pass and the poor will fail. But the system not tell you that. You know what the system said? The system said the heights of great men, rich and kept, were not attained by sudden flight. But they, while their companions slept, were toiling upwards through the night. That means, say, if you fail, it's because you not toil. It's because you not work hard and it's because you're poor. Hmm? Mark said the system tell you things like labor for learning before you grow old. Now, you know what he said? It has to be labor because it must hard. Hmm? Labor for learning before you grow old because learning is better than silver and gold. Mark said that, well, that is a lie. That can't be true because the only reason you want learning is so you can get silver and gold. So how come learning is better than silver and gold? Him say, mash down that lie. It says silver and gold will vanish away. Mark says, that's another lie. Silver and gold don't vanish away. Instead, the rich take it and then pass down to them sons and it pass down to the next son. Yeah? And you see that with your good education and you still out this are decay. Mark says the education system also teach us the false class consciousness. The set of lies that justify your oppression, that keep you in the exploitive relationship with the bourgeois. And so the exploitation continues for a long time and society is filled with conflict. However, Marx says this exploitive system may remain for a long time, but it will not be forever. Him say it is going to be there for a while and the poor people have to suffer enough, enough and it will be there and it will seem unending but it will not be forever. Instead, Mark says, there is going to come a time, there's going to come a time when the proletariats are going to see through the false class, class consciousness, sorry. The proletariats are going to see through the false class consciousness and they are going to stage a bloody revolution which will destroy the exploitive capitalist system. Marx, listen to me. If you look at history, and that is why Marx theory is called a historical theory. He says if you look through history, Throughout time, once you have exploitation, there have always been a revolution. In say, if you take from even Bible time, yeah, when you have slavery, and we're not talking about black man slavery, no, we're talking about white man slavery, from when white man are enslaved white man. Once there is exploitation, it leads to the revolution. And so when Pharaoh did a hold on God people there, Moses, and not lies, Moses, yes, it's Moses they do it. Oh my Lord, my mother would be so ashamed. But anyways, when Pharaoh they hold on the people then, automatically when it was that they come and say, let my people go. That was really the revolution when them cross the Red Sea and move on. That is because the exploited actually decided that enough is enough. We now build no more pyramid, fear of ability yourself. We are left out here. Yeah, that is the revolution. Because once there is exploitation, there will always be revolution. Unfortunately, after that system, that system of slavery, it led us to feudalism. And feudalism, if you look at history, was also an exploitive system. Now, feudalism is when you have like the royals and the lords and you have the serfs. We don't know what show like Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's the feudal era. That's what it's based on. Like Robin Hood. That's the feudal era, when you have the royals at the top and then you have the little peasants them down at the bottom and the little peasants them work hard, 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 hard and them farm and them do everything they can and all the money that they make still go to the royals who just born in privilege, yeah? 
him said that system, it might not have been slavery, but it was still very exploitive. And it was because it was so exploitive that it led to a revolution, yeah? At that time, he uses the example of the French Revolution. Now, when my history people them there, you remember the French Revolution? One of the bloodiest revolutions in history? Marx said that happened because there was one small rich group exploiting a large poor group. Now, the French Revolution, you know, start with a lady, you know, a queen. Her name was Marie Antoinette. Now, Marie Antoinette was about 15 or 16 at the time, and she was the queen of France, yeah? And Marie Antoinette, a real hot girl. Like, no, like proper, proper art. Marie take the whole of France budget to buy clothes and wig and, you know, makeup and so Yeah, Marie set. And so many times people are watching and I say, but France not no money. And, oh, Marie not so. Marie not care. So Marie live. And there came a time that France had famine. And when France had the famine, the poor people, they must suffer. They can't find no water. They can't have no food. They must suffer. They marched to the queen. And of course, I was giving a synopsis of it. Yeah. They marched to the queen and they said, Queenie, we want food. Queenie, feed where we are dead. Marie come to her friend. She said, what's the commotion outside? Yeah. Them say, queen, are the people them? Them say, them want food. Marie got there, she said, they want, no, they, I'm not for the people, they said they want bread. <laughs> yeah, just that bread. Marie said, they want bread, let them eat cake. No, that means that Marie said she doesn't care about them, you know. Because if you can't find flour and water, you get bread. Where you go find flour and water, sugar, egg, oil, you make cake. So Marie saying she don't care. And so when it is that the people hear about it, they storm the castle. And then chop off Marie head and then put it on a spike. And then them go through Paris and anybody will look rich. Dead. Yeah? Look by you and a famine. Oh, you look so fat. Dead. Why you doing a gold chain? No, man, you are royal. Dead. You have asked, everybody has asked dead. Dead. Yeah? The historians say that the streets of Paris were paved red with blood. Now, of course, that is a simplistic explanation of the French Revolution. But what Marx was saying is that this revolution took place because the poor were being exploited. There was a group of persons, a large group, that were so exploited they had to actually lead an uprising. And that actually changed the entire society. It changed the society from feudalism to capitalism. And capitalism is a society that we're living in now. Unfortunately, Capitalism is also exploitive. Within the capitalist society now, you have the rich who are the bourgeois, those who own the means of production, those who own the big companies, etc. And they now are exploiting the proletariats. So once again, there is exploitation. And once there is exploitation, it will lead to conflict. And according to Marx, will lead to the revolution. So Marx says one day, the proletariats, they're going to see through the false class consciousness and they're going to stage a bloody revolution that will end capitalism. And when capitalism ends, when capitalism ends, Marx says, we're going to move to the final era, which is communism. Marx says when it is that the proletariats rise up, and they overthrow the bourgeois. We're going to move to the final era, which is communism. And communism is going to last forever. Communism is going to last forever because there is no exploitation. In a communist society, all men are equal. Yeah? And so if there is no exploitation, there will be no conflict. And if there is no conflict, there will not be any need for a revolution. So we're going to live in peace together forever. That is how Marx is the society. So Marx says, if you look at where we are now, we are in this capitalist society that exists because of this poor rich group, the, sorry, this small rich group, the bourgeois, who are exploiting the large poor group, the proletariat. That is the basis of capitalism. That is how society exists right now. Yeah? And as a result of that, it is filled with conflict. Because the bourgeois are taking advantage of the proletariats. And the proletariats exist 
in this exploitation because they're taught the lies, the false class consciousness, taught by all the institutions, and these institutions are owned by the bourgeois, yeah? And they teach us the false class consciousness that keep us oppressed, according to Marx. But Marx says, one day, we're going to see through the false class consciousness. One day we're going to see say religion is a set of lies. And that the education system as it is is a terrible pure rubbish. And we are going to rise up as the rich and we're going to, as the poor, sorry, against the rich. And there's going to be a bloody revolution that will end capitalism and lead to communism. And communism will last forever. Yeah? Marx said at that time religion will disappear. Religion will disappear because, remember, religion is there to teach us the false class consciousness. And so if you know that the false class consciousness is a set of lies, then religion are going to disappear. That's what Marx says. Now, I said to you last week, every perspective has the critics. Every single solitary theory you can look at, you have somebody that will say, but these are the flaws. Marxism is no different. So Marx has some critics. Yeah, the first thing them say about Marx is that Marx have a utopian view of the future. He has this utopian view of communism. Now remember the criticism of the functionalists is that the, the functionalists are utopian as well. However, whereas the functionalists have a utopian view of the present, the Marxists have a utopian view of the future. Because Marx take it for granted that we're all going to come together and live in a society of equality where everybody share everything. The critics said that that are rubbish. The critics said that humans by their very nature are bad mind and grudgeful and red yai. And so they don't want to live in a society where everything is equal. I put it to you that if you go into a class and you get a test and you get 85, you feel good. You call your mother, you call your friend, you big up yourself. Till you hear say everybody else get 95. All of a sudden you get mixed with your bad mind self. Yeah? All of a sudden you get, and you call miss, no miss, you have to deal with it. All the don't want to get more than, no miss, me, me, I forget five more miss, yeah? They say by nature, humans bad mind and grudgeful and red eye. And so you find that we're not going to have a communist society where all men are equal. That's a utopian view that Marx have. Marx don't see that there can never be total equality because even in a society where there is supposed to be equality, the people who are in charge of that society, they are going to want to get more than the rest of people them. Yeah, you remember Animal Farm? If you read Animal Farm, Napoleon said it well, that even in equality, there are some who are more equal than others. And so if you are in charge, just think about when you share food. Notice when you share dinner, you know? the part of the meat where you like, you get it first. Yeah, if it's something you like, you get all the most. My brother-in-law, when you share chicken, he said, no leg, no dead. I say, how oh, come? Because it's not a legless chicken, so how oh, come? When you go in a film place, you see him put him leg down at the bottom, then him put the rice, then him put her next leg at the top. You have to go dig it up and I say, oh, it's her. Yeah, because you look after yourself first. And so you find that when you get to a communist society, the equality that Marx expects where we're going to all live together, kumbaya and all is great, the critics, like all hubs, say, no, no, that will never happen because it's against the nature of humans who are bad men. Yeah? The next criticism of Marx is that Marx expects that the revolution will happen, the proletariat revolution will happen, where all the proletariats will get together and overthrow the bourgeois. Now remember who are proletariats? Anybody who don't own the means of production, who don't own a big company, all of them people there, when they own big business, them are proletariat. That means a teacher are proletariat, nurse are proletariat, conductor are proletariat, doctor are proletariat, vendor are proletariat. And Marx expects that all of them are going to come together as one and have the revolution. The critics say that that will never happen. The revolution will never take place. Because the teacher or the nurse are going to feel like them better than the vendor or the conductor. Mm? That the doctor are going to feel like him better than the cat man. So when a time for everybody come together to have the revolution, the doctor look on him like, no sir, me and the cat man then I get together. Yeah, because you feel so you're better. You don't know say all are we poor. Really, all are we there are suffer. But the man we can actually buy two parties feels better than the man we can buy one party. 
him said the competitive nature that's what the critics said the competitive nature of humans are going to stop the proletariat from coming together to have the revolution because poor people are compete with poor people i can tell you that i grew up very 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 poor everybody in the middle lane poor like the dirt lane where we live in yeah and still me and my friend them with my poor self i compare who for fake transport faker no everybody transport faker you know all of my mother got the same old silver guys. And I still live on at least mine a John. Yours a Jen. What name Jen Sport? Yeah? Now mine I'll tear up before a few more. But me not care. My name Jan. Yeah? So the fact of the matter is that that sort of thing, that sort of competitive mentality is going to prevent the revolution. Another key criticism of Marx is that Marx's religion will disappear. The critics said there is no evidence that religion will ever disappear. They said since the beginning of time, when you look through man's drawings, religion has always been there, evidence of religion. Them said two things always did, religion and cockroach. So apparently cockroach can't dead. But religion did always did it too. And so you find that Marxist view that religion will just up and disappear. Them said rubbish, when you persecute religious people, people get more religious. Right now, if tomorrow you hear that the COVID vaccine come, yeah, but it to get the COVID vaccine, you have to say there is no God. You start saying, eh, love me and God. Make, make this all right. God know him, I do the devil send it come. Yeah? So when you persecute religious people, they get more religious. No, you're not even religious right now, you know. You can't tell us so you say your prayers. But I saw them stay. Yeah? Finally, Marx is seen as economically deterministic. He believed that the economy determined everything else. And the critics say that that is not necessarily the, the truth, yeah? So Marx is a big conflict theorist. Remember, Marx is not the conflict perspective. He's one of, yeah? But Marx is huge. And he says that the society exists now, the capitalist society, is one filled with conflict because the small rich group continues to exploit the large poor group, the bourgeois exploit the proletariats, yeah? And we remain in that relationship because of the false class consciousness. But he expects that one day it will all come to an end. He does. He believes one day there'll be a bloody revolution because you see through the false class consciousness and that will lead to the final era, which is communism. That is the theory of Karl Marx, written in his book, The Communist Manifesto, yes? And so, we have come to the end of today's Cape sociology lesson and indeed the end of another week.